Hello, everyone. I'm John Horrigan, and welcome to another episode of Journey Through the Past. Wellesley Council on Aging. Hello to everybody viewing on Wellesley Public Media. The views and opinions expressed are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Wellesley Council on Aging or Wellesley Public Media. Any content that I provide is of my own personal opinion and is not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. We're going to take a look at Paul Revere, how he was a silversmith. We'll talk about the Sons of Liberty, the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, the Powder Alarm, and then his midnight ride and his capture. And of course, the shot heard around the world, the American Revolution began on April 19, 1775. Paul Revere was born in Boston's North End on December 21st, 1734. He died May 10th, 1818 at the age of 83. His house you can visit today. It was built in 1676. It's the second house because the first house was burnt down in the Great Fire in Boston in the year 1676. And he's buried in the Granary Burying Ground in Boston, Mass. He was a silversmith a dentist, an artist, a patriot. His spouses were Sarah Orne and Rachel Walker, and he was celebrated after his death for his role as a messenger in the battles of Lexington and Concord, and Revere's name and his midnight ride are synonymous with colonial patriotism. He helped organize an intelligence network and an alarm system to keep watch on the British military. Now, he was the son of a French Huguenot father and a Boston mother. And he had 11 siblings with whom he appears to have not been particularly close. And he was the third oldest child and the eldest surviving son. And his father was born Apollos Revoir. And he came to Boston at the age of 13 and was apprenticed to the silversmith John Coney. And by the time he married Deborah Hitchborn, Paul Revere's mother, a member of a long-standing Boston family that owned a small shipping wharf, Revoir had anglicized his name to Paul Revere. Now, Paul Revere fought briefly in the Seven Years' War, known as the French and Indian War. He served as a second lieutenant in an artillery regiment that attempted to take the French fort at Crown Point in present-day New York. And upon leaving the Army, Revere returned to Boston and assumed control of the family silver shop in his own name. He was a skilled engraver and one of the few craftsmen who could complete a piece of silver even to the engraved decoration. Over 5,000 products were crafted by the shop, like plates, bowls, spoons, buckles, and buttons. And he was also a prominent Freemason. Now, Paul Revere was the first American to learn how to roll copper into sheets. And his foundry provided the copper plating, fittings, and sodding for the USS Constitution, old Ironsides. And he made the copper dome for the Mass State House. He had locations in Canton that he managed, and in Boston, a location that his son managed. And his foundry made over 1,000 bells. Now, Revere later served as an officer in the Penobscot Expedition, one of the most disastrous campaigns of the American Revolutionary War, a role for which he was later exonerated. The Penobscot Expedition was the largest American naval expedition of the American Revolutionary War and the United States' worst naval defeat until Pearl Harbor. The fighting took place on both land and on sea in what is today Maine in June in the year 1779. British Army forces established a new colony known as New Ireland. And in response, the state of Massachusetts, with some support from the Continental Congress, raised an expedition to drive the British out. Now, the operation ended in disaster when a British fleet drove the American fleet to total destruction up the Penobscot River and the survivors of the American expedition were forced to walk back to Massachusetts, starving and unarmed. Now, Revere befriended numerous political agitators, including John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and most closely, Dr. Joseph Warren. Now, Paul Revere then joined the Sons of Liberty, and this is the famous portrait of Revere by John Singleton Copley, painted just before the American Revolution, 1768 to 1770. And the background you see here with the vertical red stripes, that's the flag of the Sons of Liberty. And it was a political group made up of American patriots that was formed to protect the rights of the colonists from the usurpations by the British government after 1766. And they're best known for undertaking the Boston Tea Party, December 16, 1773. 
Now, Boston had the Boston Caucus Club, led by Samuel Adams, along with artisans, merchants, tradesmen, and professionals, as well as the Loyal Nine. Groups such as these were absorbed into the greater Sons of Liberty organization. And its name comes from a speech in the British Parliament by Colonel Isaac Barry, referring to the colonials as Sons of Liberty. Now, the name was an underground term for any men resisting new crown taxes and laws. And their motto, of course, became no taxation without representation. A unifying name helped to promote intercolonial efforts against Parliament and the Crown's actions. In the summer of 1765, Boston was marked by militant citizens demonstrating against the Stamp Act. Now, the Stamp Act of 1765 was a direct tax imposed by the British Parliament specifically on the colonies, and it required that printed materials in the colonies be produced on stamped paper that was produced or stamped in London, England. And these included any legal documents, magazines, newspapers, and other types of paper used throughout the colonies. And the stamp tax had to be paid in valid British currency, not in colonial paper money. And the tax was to help pay for troops stationed in North America after the British victory in the Seven Years' War. And the British government felt that the colonies were the primary beneficiaries of this military presence and should pay at least a portion of the expense. Now, the Liberty Tree, there's a photo of the original Liberty Tree in Boston. And the well-known label Sons of Liberty allowed organizers to issue anonymous summons to a Liberty Tree, a Liberty Pole, or other public meeting places. On August 14, 1765, a group of men calling themselves the Sons of Liberty gathered in Boston under a large elm tree at the corner of Essex Street and Orange Street near Hanover Square to protest the hated and dreaded Stamp Act. Now, the Sons of Liberty concluded their protest by lynching two tax collectors in effigy from the tree. And from that day forward, the tree became known as the Liberty Tree. And the tree was often decorated with banners and lanterns, and assemblies were regularly held to express views and, of course, to vent emotions. And a flagstaff or a pole was raised within the tree's branches, and when an ensign, usually yellow, a flag was raised, that meant that the Sons of Liberty were to meet. Now, on September 11, 1765, a copper plate with large golden letters was placed on its trunk, bearing the inscription, The Tree of Liberty. And of course, the Liberty Tree today, one block east of Boylston Station on the Green Line and Boston Common at Washington and Essex Street is the site of the famous Liberty Tree. And you can see it here on the side of a building. Now, what about the Liberty Pole? Well, a Liberty Pole was a tall wooden pole planted in the ground, which may be surmounted by an ensign, again, a flag or a banner, or a Liberty cap, an actual hat. Now, a liberty pole was often erected in town squares in the years before and during the American Revolution. For instance, Bev Bedford, Massachusetts, Concord, Massachusetts, and Newport, Rhode Island all had liberty poles. And some colonists erected liberty poles on their own private lands, such as in Woburn, Massachusetts, and the pole raising there is reenacted annually. And I've also participated as a colonial reenactor in the Bedford pole capping. Now, an often violent struggle over liberty poles erected by the Sons of Liberty in New York raged for 10 years between the British and the colonists. The poles were periodically destroyed by the royal authorities only to be replaced by the Sons of Liberty with new ones. And when an ensign was raised, usually red in this case, on a liberty pole, it would be calling for the Sons of Liberty or townspeople to meet and vent or express their views regarding British rule. So they used a yellow uh, ensign in Massachusetts, a red one in New York City. And it's also apparent in many seals and coats of arms as a sign of liberty, freedom, and independence, the Liberty Pole. On August 4th, 1757, he married Sarah Orne, who bore eight children, six of whom survived. And during the 1760s, he produced a number of political engravings and advertised as a dentist. Now, the Townsend Acts. British Army troops were sent to Boston in 1768 to help officials enforce the Townsend Acts, which was a series of laws passed by the British Parliament. And these acts were enacted to enforce British colonial rule over the colonies. And they were also an effective means of enforcing compliance with trade regulations and to establish the controversial precedent that Parliament had the right to tax the American colonies. And of course, the Boston Massacre, took place on March 5th, 1770, 
in which British redcoats killed five civilian men, and it helped spark the rebellion in some of the British American colonies, which culminated in the American Revolutionary War, and the British increase in troops in Boston led to a tense situation that erupted into brawls between soldiers and civilians alike. Now, the troops fired after being threatened by a mob, and three civilians were killed at the scene of the shooting, 11 were injured, and two died after the incident. It actually, um, because there was a snowstorm that took place um, uh, during the funeral of Christopher Sider, who was killed by a loyalist in February of 1770, and that made for great ice chunks to hurl at the British soldiers. And that's what precipitated and ignited the Boston Massacre. And this is Paul Revere's, uh, one of his most famous engravings done in the wake of the Boston Massacre. Of course, he dramatized it, and you can see it on the right. And it's not known whether Paul Revere was actually present during the Boston Massacre. There was detailed map of the bodies meant to be used in the trial of the British soldiers held responsible suggests that he had first-hand knowledge. And you can see his engraving here. And quote on the engraving, it says, The horrid massacre in Boston perpetrated in the evening of the 5th day of March, 1777, by soldiers of the 29th Regiment, which with the 14th Regiment were then quartered there, with some observations on the state of things prior to that catastrophe. Now, this is also, uh, the British referred to this as the incident on King Street. Of course, the colonists called it the Boston Massacre or the Bloody Massacre per perpetrated in King Street, Boston on March 5th, 1770 by Paul Walker, who died in 1818. And the engraving was by Paul Revere, hand-colored in 1770. And here's the mysterious part about this engraving where the arrow's pointing. It appears that there's some sort of musket firing out of a second floor window. Why would Revere put that in there? Was there some loyalist firing from the top? Let's talk about the Boston Tea Party. Now, Paul Revere was probably present as an observer at the Boston Tea Party on December 16, 1773. Revere began work as a messenger for the Boston Committee of Public Safety, often writing messages to New York and Philadelphia about the political unrest in the city of Boston. And in 1774, Britain closed the port of Boston and began to quarter soldiers in great numbers all around Boston. And around this time, Revere contributed engravings to the Patriot Monthly magazine called the Royal American Magazine. And his silver business was faltering, and it was largely now in the hands of his son, Paul Revere Jr. The Powder Alarm. It was a dress rehearsal for the American Revolution for both sides, both the British and the colonists. General Thomas Gage planned the disarmament operation in high secrecy and selected Lieutenant Colonel George Madison, commander of the 4th King's Own Foot, for the mission. This is late August 1774. Now, the British Army had stockpiled munitions. Some were fortifications manned by small garrisons, while others were locked magazines. And most of the powder was under the control of the provincial governments. Some was the property of individual towns, and towns began to withdraw their own powder and left the provincial powder. Now, the largest stockpile of gunpowder in New England was stored at the provincial powder house high on a remote hill six miles northwest of Boston. Today, it's in modern Somerville. And the Loyalists called this powder the King's Powder. Now, the other Massachusetts residents, Whigs, felt that it belonged to them. So you have Whigs that were against the crown, and then you had Tories that were pro-British, pro-crown. Now, on August 31st, 1774, Gage sent Middlesex County Sheriff David Phipps to Brattle, who was in charge of the King's Powder, with orders to remove and seize the provincial powder. Now, William Brattle then turned the key of the provincial powder house over to Phipps, who gave them to Madison. Now, General Gage gave orders to Madison to ready some troops for the removal operation, which relied on complete secrecy in order to be successful. So, Madison then mobilized 260 British troops, but it didn't go unnoticed by residents of Boston. So, 260 troops, about 10 commanding officers and 250 regulars, each were to take a keg of powder on their shoulders. So they left Boston Common at 4.30 a.m. on the morning of September 1st, 1774. The expedition was to depart from Long Wharf and 13 long boats that were loaned from the British Navy, right here. Then they would row up the Mystic River to a debarkation point in the Charlestown area known as Ten Hills. 
on the Mystic River. And you can see the route that they took. They landed at a place called Temple's Farm. Then they marched northwest over Winter Hill, which was about a mile from the river. Now, the provincial powder house was situated on a place called Quarry Hill on the road to Arlington, right here. And the troops then waited for daybreak because they didn't want to enter a powder magazine with lit torches, lit lanterns. And at sunrise, they seized over 250 barrels of gunpowder and then carried them on their shoulders back to the longboats. Now, some of the soldiers detached from the main body and then marched to Cambridge, where they seized two more cannons. And from there, they crossed the Charles River and marched through Brookline and eventually Roxbury. Before 11 a.m., they crossed Boston Neck and were back at Long Wharf. By noon, the cannon and the powder were shipped three miles offshore to Castle William. Today, we call that Castle Island right here. The operation was executed with cunning and precision, took the colonists completely by surprise. And they were aided in their mission by a tavern keeper in Cambridge who loaned them horses to haul off the two field pieces of artillery, the cannon. But because this operation was such a tactical success, it was met with no resistance and taught the colonists a valuable lesson in that they would not be caught by surprise again in the spring of 1775. They knew that the British were coming. But the British were unprepared for the psychological backlash that awaited them. People were furious. Word spread like wildfire. 4,000 armed men moved into Cambridge after hearing rumors that six colonists had been killed by British soldiers. In Pomfret, Connecticut, Colonel Israel Putnam was raising 40,000 men to march on Boston. Word even reached into the Indian country beyond the Hudson River, causing Colonel William Johnson to set out for Boston with a contingent of Mohawk warriors. But lucky, no British or colonists were injured. But William Brattle's house in Cambridge was pulled down after a bit of a scuffle and a riot. Now, what dispersed all these men about to invade Boston and start the American Revolution late in the afternoon of September 1st and early in the morning, September 2nd, 1774? William Brattle had a letter, and it was published on September 2nd, 1774. Apparently, it had fallen out of his pocket while he was riding. And here's the letter right here. And again, William Brattle's house in Cambridge was pulled down board by board after this letter was published that showed that he was colluding with the British. Several men in Cambridge bent on violence, chased William Brattle out of his house in Cambridge and into the protection like the military after his letter was published on September 2nd. Tory barrister Jonathan Sewell fled Boston and eventually America after his servant fired a pistol at the mob outside of the house and they literally chased Sewell out of his house and into Boston. And a mob approached Tory Sheriff Colonel David Phipps, who handed over the keys to the powder house and made him swear in writing that he would never enforce the coercive acts. Lieutenant Governor Thomas Oliver was forced to resign his seat on Great Gage's Royal Council. Quote, my house at Cambridge being surrounded by about 4,000 people in compliance with their command, I sign my name. Customs Commissioner Benjamin Hallowell fled for his life on horseback as 160 angry Whigs pursued him at full gallop, firing their pistols along the way. He finally found shelter on Boston Neck as he scrambled behind British lines just as his horse collapsed. Benjamin Church began reporting back to General Gage on colonial intentions, meetings, and tactics. Uh, all of the colonists came streaming into the foot of Boston Neck. They were ready to raid Boston and begin the revolution right there. And they were all set to go into Boston, except one thing happened that diverted them. It rained, it poured, and that scattered the colonists and sent them back to their villages and their towns. On December 12, 1774, intelligence received by Paul Revere indicated that another seizure of stores at Fort William and Mary in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was imminent. And he rode from Boston to Portsmouth the next day, December 13, 1774, to notify the local patriots, who quickly raided the fort on the 14th of December and removed all of its supplies. Revere's intelligence had been incorrect, though. While the British operation had been contemplated, it had not yet been ordered. And the British did eventually send ships carrying troops to Portsmouth, but they arrived long after the event. In fact, the first British troops didn't arrive until February 27, 1775, and they were directed into shallows at high tide by a local Patriot pilot. 
much to the captain's anger. Now, these stores of gunpowder, typically referred to as lo by loyalists as the king's powder and by patriots as the malicious powder, were also carried off from forts in Salem, Massachusetts, Newport, Rhode Island, and Providence, Rhode Island, and also New London, Connecticut. And they moved the powder, the, the uh, colonists did, inward into the interior, uh, away from the coast so the British couldn't get them. But uh, when they showed up at Portsmouth, the British, they were had their... The colonists in Portsmouth were thumbing their noses at the British, and they had already taken the powder and their weaponry and moved it and hid it out into the woods. They would never be caught unaware again, as they were after the original powder alarm of September 1st, 1774. Now, after the powder alarm, militia forces throughout New England were more cautious with their supplies and more intent on gaining information about Gage's plans and troop movements. They developed an espionage network. And Paul Revere played a significant role in distributing this information due to his geographical position in Boston, his social position as a middle-class craftsman in contact with all social classes, and his political position as a well-known patriot propagandist and organizer. Now, on March 6th, 1775, in the Old South Meeting House, Revere, John Hancock, and both John and Samuel Adams were commemorating the fifth anniversary of the Boston Massacre. Now, after Dr. Joseph Warren gave a spirited speech, Samuel Adams then thanked him. But there were several British officers in the crowd, spies, and they began to hiss, and one, one shouted, Oh, fie! Oh, fie! Which is a, a curse for, for British in 18th century London. Now, which means, oh, bollocks. <laughs> so the people of Boston didn't understand the dialect of the British imperial elite, and they misinterpreted his cry as, oh, fire, oh, fire, and panic broke out. Men and women ran from the doors of the Old South Meeting House, and some jumped out of the windows. And just then, the 43rd British Regiment, complete with fife and drums, was parading by the meet meeting house to show uh, a sign of intimidation. And the people thought they were about to be attacked. So Lieutenant McKenzie, the adjutant of the 23rd Royal Welsh Fusiliers, observed that almost every man had a short stick or bludgeon in his hand, and many of them were privately armed. Any violent act would have been the signal for battle. Both sides were ripe for it, and a single blow would have the occasion the commencement of the hostilities. Now, Lord North, you can see this is a political cartoon satirist by Paul Revere. Lord North pours tea into a helpless America's mouth while Lord Mansfield pinions her arms. The Earl of Sandwich peeks under her skirt and Britannia averts her eyes. And this cartoon was done by Paul Revere in 1775. So on January 27, 1775, General Thomas Gage, Commander-in-Chief of the British Forces in North America, received orders from London from the Earl of Dartmouth to take decisive action against the growing rebellion in America, especially in Boston. And given intelligence that rebels were, had been stockpiling weapons at Concord, Massachusetts, he ordered a troop of British regulars to march there on the night of April 18, 1775, to take them, to confiscate them. Dr. Benjamin Church, he was the first Surgeon General of the U.S. Army, and he had been attending Sons of Liberty meetings and reporting back to General Gage about colonial intentions and plans. He was a spy for the British. One of his letters into Boston was intercepted, and he was tried and convicted of, quote, communicating with the enemy. Now, Margaret Peggy Kemble Gage, she was the wife of General Thomas Gage, and she allegedly provided Dr. Joseph Warren information regarding General Rage's intended raids at Lexington and Concord. Some say that Warren and Peggy were having an affair. Others say they were very close friends, and uh, they communicated. Now, although there's no documented evidence that confirms Gage as Warren's informer, speculation of her being a spy for the Patriots remained due to her familial ties to America. She was a lady of div uh, divided loyalties to both her husband and to her native land. She was born in the colonies. And as a result, uh, Gage sent her to England aboard the Charming Nancy uh, on his orders in the summer of 1775. Get her out of here just in case she is flirting with the enemy. So on Thursday, April 6th, 1775, Admiral Graves, acting on General Gage's orders, was preparing to move troops from Boston across Back Bay to Cambridge. He ordered ships in the harbor to launch their longboats and moor them to their sterns. Now, Admiral Graves actually detested General Gage, and he was not that bright, so he had the maneuver conducted in broad daylight on April 7th, 1775, and everybody saw it. 
The Whigs observed this activity, and they also learned of a British party of officers who were examining the roads to Concord. And they put this intelligence together and figured that the British would move on Concord on Sunday, the 9th of April, 1775. Now, Revere left for Concord to spread the alarm on Saturday, April 8th, a false alarm. He carried a letter from Joseph Warren and addressed the leaders of the town that evening. Now, Concord's Jonathan Hosmer said, We daily expect a tumult. There came up a post to Concord Saturday night, which informs them that the regulars are coming up to Concord the next day. And if they come, I believe there will be bloody work. So the people of Concord began moving military supplies out of town and hiding them in surrounding communities. And the Provincial Congress meeting there agreed to adjourn on April 15th for three weeks. So Paul Revere's trip was reported back to General Gage of the British. And the note said, quote, last Saturday, PR, Paul Revere, toward evening arrived at Concord carrying a letter that was said to be from Mr. W, Joseph Warren. On Saturday, April 15th, General Gage ordered his regimental commanders to relieve their elite companies of grenadier and light infantry from all duties till further orders. The official explanation was that the men were to learn new evolutions, but nobody believed it. New evolutions meaning get training. Nobody believed it. And you can see, by the way, the Boston Peninsula there on the right-hand side where the, the red uh, squares are British occupation. So the orders were sent to 11 regiments and instantly became common knowledge around the town of Boston. Something was up. On April 16th, Paul Revere then rode to Lexington to inform Samuel Adams and John Hancock of this development. So Revere's made two rides all already out to let them know that the British are coming. This is before his famous midnight ride. So the Committee of Safety put watchmen in Roxbury, Cambridge, and Charlestown to guard the exits of Boston. They wanted to know exactly what the British were doing. And the Provincial Congress and its committees then organized an alarm system throughout New England. So, Paul Revere's second ride was also reported back to General Gage, and an alert British officer wrote, quote, the inhabitants conjectured that some secret expedition was on foot. So the British knew that we knew. And Revere worked out expresses, that's an alarm system, to deliver the news if the British were to move. Special messengers by clandestine and routes and a backup system of lantern signals from Boston to Charlestown. So, on Tuesday, April 18th, a British spy reported back to Gage that all military munitions had been moved out of Concord, but large stocks of provisions were there, along with a 24-pound cannon. Gage realized that in order for this mission to be successful, it had to be done in secrecy, and the Whig Express riders had to be stopped. They didn't want them to notify the surrounding villages and towns that the British regulars were coming out of Boston. So, on the morning of April 18, 1775, General Gage sent out 10 officers and 10 sergeants on orders to intercept all messengers. Later on, some of these officers will actually grab Revere. So, you can see by the blue circles here where they position themselves on the right-hand side. They positioned themselves at choke points along roads between Boston and Concord. They were at Roxbury, Brookline, Charlestown Neck, Cambridge, Lexington, and the Great Bridge at Watertown. So, the peculiar behavior of the British was noticed by residents in Boston as their officers appeared to be just killing time. Something was up. And these officers walked their horses, they had dinner at taverns, and they stayed outdoors after sundown. Unlike British behavior, unlike the Imperial Army's behavior in Boston. And they were in full military uniforms with cockades, and they were inquiring as to the whereabouts of John Hancock on the left and Samuel Adams on the right. And Elbridge Gary alerted the two by sending them a note. So Hancock and Adams knew something was afoot with the British. And then late on the afternoon of April 18th, a stable boy sprinted through the streets of Boston and alerted Paul Revere that the regulars were preparing to march. And while preparing their horses, the British officers were heard to murmur, there will be hell to pay tomorrow. Word was out. So Revere told him that he was the third person to give him this information in just a few hours. And residents noticed an uncommon number of officers striding up and down Long Wharf, talking amongst themselves on the far end of the pier, out of earshot from everyone else. 
Now, crewmen were preparing longboats moored against the huge British warships, the HMS Boyne and the HMS Somerset. And British seamen were seen on shore in shops, hurrying to complete what seemed to be last-minute errands, including visiting prostitutes. And Warren talked to Peggy Gage, and she got the word out. Everyone knew. In fact, after the meeting with General Gage, Lord Percy, sworn to secrecy with the orders after coming out of a meeting, heard a group of men on Boston Common saying that the British troops have marched but will miss their aim. So Percy asked, what well, aim? And the men replied, why the cannon had conquered. So everybody knew the British were coming. They just didn't know when. According to Revere, quote, Dr. Warren sent in haste for me and begged that I would immediately set off for Lexington, where Messrs. Hancock and Adams were, and acquaint them of the movement, and that it was thought they were the objects. British are coming after you, Hancock and Adams. Now, Revere's main objective was to warn Hancock and Adams. Concord and his munitions were only mentioned to him in a secondary way. So Revere wanted to send duplicate dispatches by multiple routes, send out many alarm riders. And one message had been entrusted to a Boston tanner, somebody who worked with hides, by the name of William Dawes. Now, William Dawes, he was born April of 1745, so he was about 30 when this operation took place, and he passed on February 25th, 1799. Now, it's likely that in September 1774, just after the powder alarm, Dawes was instrumental in helping Boston's Militia Artillery Company secure its four small cannons from British Army control. The Massachusetts Provincial Congress certainly sent word to him in February 1775 that it was time to move two of those weapons out of Boston. This is just about the time of the Portsmouth raid by the British. So Dawes was assigned by Dr. Joseph Warren to ride from Boston, Massachusetts to Lexington on the night of April 18, 1775, when it became clear that a British column was going to march into the countryside. Dawes' mission was also to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams that they were in danger of arrest. So Dawes took the land route out of Boston through Boston Neck, right down the causeway from Shawmut Peninsula, and leaving just before the military had sealed off the town. He had a note, and it read, Quote, a large body of the king's troops, supposed to be a brigade of about 1,200 to 1,500, were embarked in boats from Boston and had gone to land at Leachmere's Point. So Dawes went through Boston Neck, guarded by British sentries, and was remembered to have been mounted on a slow jogging horse with saddlebags behind him and a large flapped hat upon his head to resemble a countryman on a journey. He's trying to sneak out of town. In fact, Dawes knew one of the British sentries right there at the Shawmut Peninsula at the Boston Neck, and he managed to talk his way through. And just moments later, the order came to close off Boston Neck. So Dawes eluded British patrols in Roxbury and rode west through Brookline to the Great Bridge that spanned the Charles River at Cambridge. Now, the previous week, when he returned from Concord after spreading the false alarm, Revere stopped in to see Colonel William Conant in Charlestown, along with their Whig leaders, to discuss a contingency plan of warning the countryside of a British expedition if no riders were able to leave Boston. So, quote, according to Revere, I agreed with the Colonel Conant and some other gentlemen that if the British went out by water, we would shoo them two lanterns in the North Church steeple, and if by land one, as a signal, for we were apprehensive, it would be difficult to cross the Charles River or get over Boston Neck. One if by land, two if by sea. Now, lanterns is an archaic expression that was used in England, but also it was widely used in Massachusetts at the time for translucent lantern sides made the old fashioned way from thin pieces of cow horn, and they emitted a dim, uncertain light. And they actually recovered one of those on display there. And the problem was, how do you make them visible from Boston to Charlestown, which was over a quarter mile distant? So Christ Church, today we call it Old North Church, was chosen because it was the city's tallest building and it could be seen from the north end in Charlestown. But it was an Anglican church and its pastor was a loyalist, a Tory. So Revere engaged a vestryman, who was a Whig, John Pulling, to help him out. Now Revere also knew the sexton of the church, an artisan by the name of Robert Newman. In pulling, Newman and another man by the name of Thomas Bernard were alerted by Revere on April 18th to, quote, be ready that night to post the lanterns. Now, around 10 p.m., after leaving Warren, Revere headed over to alert Robert Newman, whose mother ran a boarding house. 
and he peered inside the window and there he saw British officers playing cards and laughing. So he headed around back and there was Newman who had pretended to go to bed, but he slipped out the back out of his bedroom window. Now Bernard, Newman, and Pulling headed over to the church and Newman had modified two lanterns to hold larger candles with a, a, a larger light, you know, a, a more significant lux, so to speak. And they climbed 154 stairs, they drew their flints, sparked the dry tinder, and they lit the candles. And they climbed up the ladder to the very top of the steeple, which was above the bells. And they threw open the sash and held out the lanterns out of the window that faced northwest towards Charlestown. And the Charlestown Whigs saw the signal, two lanterns. That meant that British troops were leaving Boston by boat across the back bay to Cambridge. The lanterns were only visible for a moment. Newman and Pulling extinguished the lanterns, then they descended the stairs and put them into a closet. As Pulling and Newman were preparing to leave the church, they saw a detachment of British troops in the street near the door. So they ran back into the sanctuary of the church, climbed a bench near the altar, and escaped through a back window. The signal was received. The men in Charlestown saw it, and they went to the water's edge to look for Revere and readied him a horse. Revere was at his home just a few blocks from the church. He put on his boots and riding gear, and he decided not to take a pistol with him, a decision that would later save his life when he was captured. He left his house at 10.15 p.m., April 18th, 1775. Quote, I went to the north part of the town where I kept a boat. There were two experienced watermen, Joshua Bentley, who was a boat builder, and Thomas Richardson, and they helped him cross the Charles River. Now, there's the dog and spurs legend. Legend has it that Revere forgot his riding spurs, so he hastily scribbled a note attached to his dog and sent him home. Moments later, allegedly, the dog returned with the spurs attached to his collar. Now, the men pulled the boat out from underneath the wharf. Another legend has it that they forgot to get cloth to muffle the oars. So Richardson knocked softly at a nearby house, mentioned to a young lady that he knew that he needed fabric, and shortly thereafter, a petticoat came drifting down from the window, and it was still warm, and it was wrapped on the oar locks to muffle the sound. So they rode north from Boston towards Charlestown, and there was the big 64-gun warship, the HMS Somerset, that was blocking their way. It had moved there about 9 o'clock that evening to help seize all ferry traffic between Charlestown and Boston. They were locking down the city. And Revere probably heard the ship's bells marking 10.30 p.m., so silently, they passed underneath her bowsprit, not wanting to be noticed by the sailors on watch. Quote, it was then young flood, tide was coming in, and the ship was winding, and the moon was rising. Now, normally, his boat would have been revealed by the bright moon rising on this clear, mild, almost spring-like evening, but it was rising a little to the south, and thankfully, the buildings of Boston blocked it, leaving Revere's boat in shadows. He passed, quote, a little to the east of the Somerset's massive bowsprit, then pointing downstream towards the incoming tide. As he debarked from the scow at the ferry landing and walked into town, quote, I went to get me a horse. I met Colonel Conant and several others. They said they had seen our signals. I told them what was acting. He was warned about British sentries all along the road. Now, in his well-known poem, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow mentions the Somerset. There's Longfellow on the right there. Let's read that passage. Then he said good night and with muffled oar silently rode to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Longfellow. Now a deacon by the name of John Larkin gave Paul Revere his mare, which he called Brown Beauty. The horse was big, strong, and very fast. Revere said, I set off upon a pretty good horse, and it was then about 11 o'clock and very pleasant. And he's off. Revere headed north along Charlestown Neck and then west towards Lexington. Suddenly, he saw two British officers and turned sharply and, quote, rid upon full gallop for the Mystic Road, leaving them in this dust. Now, he rode through Mystic, which today is known as Medford, and then North Cambridge, and then through Monotomy, which is today known as Arlington. <laughs> 
he jumped onto the King's Highway, the Great Road, heading towards the meeting house at Lexington Common. He turned right at Buckman Tavern and headed down Bedford Road. He came to Reverend Jonas Clark's house, filled with his large family and also with John Hancock and Sam Adams. It's now midnight. The midnight ride is on. Now he was admonished by Sergeant William Monroe for making such a ruckus. Revere said, ha, noise, you'll have noise enough before long. The regulars are coming out. The regulars are coming out. He never said the British are coming. So Clark threw open his sash, as did Adams and Hancock open up their windows when they heard the noise. Hancock, come in, Revere. We're not afraid of you. Revere asked where Dawes was. I related the story of the two officers and suppose he must have been stopped, as he ought to have been there before me. Dawes shows up, though, however, a half hour later. So Revere, Hancock, Dawes, and Adams walk down to Buckman Tavern and refresh themselves along with their horses, and then they remounted. Revere and Dawes chose to proceed to Concord in case that was the British column's goal. Revere no doubt knew that the Provincial Congress had stored munitions there, including the cannon Dawes had helped to secure. Along the way, the two men met Samuel Prescott, a local young physician who joined them. Now, Prescott was born August 19, 1751, so he's about 23 at this time, and he had just opened up a doctor's practice, and he was an express courier for the Sons of Liberty and Committees of Correspondence, and that he was an important liaison between the Concord Defense Committee and John Hancock and other leaders of the Patriots. On April 18, 1775, Samuel Prescott was in Lexington to visit his fiance, Lydia Mulliken. He was also there to report on Concord's readiness, its status, and hiding the supplies. So when Prescott left, left Lexington, it was about 1 a.m. the next morning, April 19th. And on his way back to Concord, he met Revere and Dawes, who had just left Lexington shortly before him, and they were also on their way to Concord to warn the town that the regulars were on the march. Now, a squad of mounted British officers awaited on the road between Lexington and Concord. Remember, they were sent out by Gage ahead of the British column. And they had already arrested some riders heading west with news of the troops. And they called for Dawes, Revere, and Prescott to halt. The three men rode in different directions, hoping that just one would escape. And Dawes, according to the story he told his children, rode into the yard of a house shouting that he had lured two officers there. Fearing an ambush, the officers stopped chasing him. Dawes' horse bucked him off, however, and he had to walk back to Lexington. He later said that in the morning that he returned to the same yard and he actually found the watch that had fallen out of his pocket. Otherwise, Dawes' activity during the Battle of Lexington and Concord remains unknown to this day. So, when the three continued on to Hartwell's Tavern in the lower bounds of Lincoln, they were cut off by four British horsemen who were part of a larger scouting party sent out the preceding evening. Revere was captured, but both Prescott and Dawes succeeded in making a daring run for it. And Prescott did so with a show of artful horsemanship and knowledge of the forest. Finally losing his pursuers, he circled about and headed with the utmost speed to Concord, carrying Revere's warning to his townsmen. So he gets to Concord. Now, Revere, when he was captured, he starts, what we'd say, chirping the British officers, wait until you get to Concord. They're waiting for you. Hear that? Hear the church bells? They know you're coming. You're going to get it. That's the Paul Revere uh, capture site in Lincoln, Mass. at Minuteman National Historic Park. So, and remember, Revere didn't have a pistol on him. If he was armed, they would have probably executed him. So Prescott, meanwhile, continued west to warn Acton, Massachusetts, while his brother Abel Prescott rode south to warn Sudbury in the town of Framingham. And by this time, countless riders were also dispatched from other towns to spread the warning while bell bells and cannon were rung or fired to punctuate the danger at hand. So it wasn't just these three guys. Once they told, told people, they sent, those people went out on express riders to alert the vill villages. So there were so many uh, alarm riders out that evening, not just the three, Revere, Prescott, and Dawes. Now, as the British soldiers made a ruckus as they passed the farmhouse of Josiah Nelson on what we call today Battle Road, but it was known as the Bay Road then, Nelson, in the darkness, thinking that they were colonials, said, have you heard anything about the regulars coming out? Everybody knew. But he had startled these British officers and one slashed Nelson across the head. And they threatened to burn his farm down if he told anyone about their presence or the incident. 
So his wife bandaged up his head. He snuck out the back door, jumped on his horse, and warned the countryside. That's Josiah Nelson's house. So the alarm is on. Everybody knows. So by the end of the night, there were probably as many as 40 riders throughout Middlesex County carrying the news of the Army's advancement. Revere was detained and questioned, and he was, uh, they took his horse, and they moved him on foot, and he was escorted at gunpoint by three British officers back towards Lexington. And again, giving them grief all the way, saying, wait until you see what's waiting for you. So then morning broke, and as Revere and his captors neared the Lexington meeting house, they heard shots. The shot heard around the world. So the British officers became alarmed. They took Revere's horse and rode towards the meeting house. So Revere is horseless, and he walked through a cemetery and pastures till he came back to Reverend Clark's house where Hancock and Adams were staying. And as the battle on Lexington Green continued, Revere helped John Hancock and his family escape from Lexington with all of their possessions, including a trunk full of Hancock's precious papers. Now, Israel Bissell, born in 1752, died in 1823, so he's also about 23 at this time. He would ride for four days and six hours totally, covering 345 miles. He left from Watertown, Massachusetts, and rode all the way along to Philadelphia along the old post road, shouting to arms, to arms, the war has begun. And he carried a message from General Joseph Palmer, which was copied at each of his stops and then redistributed. So here's Israel Bissell's message that would be sent out to all villages south as he goes over 300 miles to Philadelphia. Quote, Wednesday morning near 10 o'clock, Watertown, to all the friends of American liberty, be it known that this morning before break of day, a brigade consisting of about 1,000 to 1,200 men landed at Phipps Farm at Cambridge and marched to Lexington, where they found a company of our colony militia in arms, upon whom they fired without any provocation and killed six men and wounded four others. Now, keep in mind, the British had sent out 700 in column, up ahead of a reserve column of another 1,000. Okay, that's Percy's men with two cannon. So it's 700 out in front, 1,000 following them. And those were the 700 that engaged the colonists on Lexington Green. Now, meanwhile, as word gets out, all these militiamen, these Minutemen, are heading, streaming into Lexington and Concord. They're literally gaining 100 men every half hour. And they outnumbered the British after the engagement at Lexington Green by about two to one. They've got about 1,300 men. Let's look at the routes here. You can see moving out of Boston, um, the different routes here. So the British route is in red there. Dawes's route is to the south in green. So Dawes came down Boston Neck. Uh, went through Roxbury, Dorchester, through Cambridge, across uh, Charles River, Cambridge Bridge, and then basically takes the same route along the Bay Road um, as Prescott and Revere. Now, Paul Revere's route is above there in blue. You can see he leaves the, uh, just at the Old North Church, rows across to Charlestown, and then he goes up through Mystic, which is Medford, then down to Arlington, Monotomy, and then moves along the same route. And again, if you can look at this, uh, Revere and Dawes reached Lexington before the British uh, reached Leachmere Point, and Dr. Prescott then joins them after they leave for Concord. So there's three of them now. And you can see as the lines move out, uh, Prescott is in purple there, and British uh, patrol stops Revere, Dawes, and Prescott. And then Revere is the one captured. The other two riders get away. And, of course, Prescott reach, uh, reaches uh, Miriam's Corner, then on to Concord to warn them that the Regulars are out. The regulars are coming. Again, another look at the midnight ride. 12 a.m., Revere arrives at Lexington. And then at 12.30 a.m., Dawes arrives a half hour later, joins Revere as they ride to Concord. At 12.45 a.m., Revere and Dawes meet Prescott. And then at 1 a.m., that's when the British patrol captures Revere, but Dawes and Prescott managed to elude their captors. And by the way, just looking back at Dawes on the far right, he left at 9.30 for Lexington, so he actually left before Revere because Revere left at 10 p.m. Again, showing you the routes as they leave uh, Boston and head towards Concord. There's a depiction of Revere in his old age. So the American Revolution had begun, but essentially they engaged the uh, British at Lexington Green. Uh, the British got the upper hand, killed some colonists. Then the British began to march uh, towards Concord and they were confronted there by militiamen and turned around, and they decided to head back towards Boston. And all along Bo uh, 
Battle Road from Merriam's Corner to a place called Bloody Angle. The colonists were out ahead of them, to their right, to their left, firing upon them indiscriminately. Now, the range of a musket only is less than 100 yards, so many, many of these musket balls fired by the militia uh, went harmlessly over the heads of the British soldiers. But there were some snipers there, uh, one by the name of Timothy Murphy, who fired at some of the commanders of the British column. He was a marksman. And uh, finally, the British decided to send out uh, their light infantry in a sweeping maneuver flanking on to the right and left of their position to actually try to run these colonists and flush them out of the woods because they were incurring heavy casualties the entire way. And what the uh, colonists would do with harassment fire, they'd fire on them and then they move up the road, take another position behind stone walls, not many of them hid behind trees, and again started firing at the British again. The British were surrounded. And of course, they were fighting in uh, uh, military tactics of a bygone era of the 18th century. They had no idea how to confront what was known as guerrilla warfare. So if you wanna get an idea of what the Battle of Lexington and Concord looked like with the movement of British soldiers. I like these plates by an artist, these engravings. His name is Amos Doolittle. And this is the first engraving, plate one, the Battle of Lexington, April 19, 1775. So you can see the colonists trying to get out in front of them as the British column comes through. Now this is a second plate called A View of the Town of Concord. And uh, you can see that this is Major Pitcairn and Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith of, of the British Imperial Army. They're scouting and reconnoitering a location. And just look at the mass of the troops marching in columns now. And by this time, uh, Lord Percy had joined them with two cannon. And uh, the British started to even up the ranks. They had 1,700 troops now, but the colonists were well north of 3,000, still holding that two-to-one advantage. The colonists knew the terrain. They were seizing the high ground, and they literally chased the British back to Boston. Now, one thing to, to note about the uh, Battle of Lexington and Concord, a place that I just went up to recently called Punkatasset Hill. So after Samuel Prescott warned the town of Concord of the incurring British regulars, church bells rang out after midnight. And at dawn in Concord, Colonel James Barrett returns to his farm uncontested to warn his family that the British are coming to search his property. So they bury all the munitions, muskets in his fields in, uh, with his sons, and then he returns to the impending confrontation. So hundreds of Minutemen and residents are gathered in the town, and they go up to Punkatasset Hill. And they look down and they see smoke, a smoke pall coming from the town of Concord. Barrett marches down towards uh, North Bridge on the west side of the river and uh, they're gathering strength. It's about 9 a.m. after the confrontation in Lexington and Concord. He's got about 500, but again, they're swelling in ranks. So the British had two objectives, destroy the weapons in Concord and then eat breakfast. They were hungry. They'd been up all night. And General Gage's spies had made maps that pointed out several locations of munitions, including about 14 cannons. Problem was, when they got to Barrett's farm, all the cannons and all the muskets were buried. So when the British went into uh, Lexington and Concord, they were hungry. And of course, they were seizing weapons, they were going into homes, and they purchased some food from some of the residents. Now, we know that three 24-pound cannons were dug up from Ephraim Jones Tavern's backyard. And uh, the Brits... Uh, chopped down the town's liberty pole and they put it into a pile and that's when they started a bonfire. And sparks from the bonfire ignited the town's meeting house. But temporarily, the Redcoats and residents worked together to extinguish that fire. And according to a British historian, the grenadiers spoiled some flour, knocked the trunnions off several iron guns, burned a heap of wooden spoons and cut down a liberty pole. That's it. So what did they miss? The British missed 10 tons of musket balls and cartridges, 50 reams of cartridge paper, 31 flour barrels, over 17 tons of rice, over eight tons of dried fish that were scattered throughout the towns of Middlesex County, and with significant quantities stored at Barrett's farm. So already the British operation is a complete failure. And Barrett, along with his men, when they saw the smoke, they moved their militia 1,000 yards closer to the town's muster field, which is a flat hilltop. So as a darker smoke pall rose from Concord Center, Adjutant Lieutenant Joseph Hosmer cried, will you let them burn the town down? After hearing this, Captains William Smith of Lincoln and Isaac Davis of Acton then pleaded with Barrett for a forward advance. They're burning our homes down. They're threatening our wives, our children, our mothers. 
And most of the people in Concord, the, the wives and the daughters and the sons, had moved into the woods hiding from the British. So Barrett finally relented. He formed up two regiments, and he had them load up and shouted that his troops would not be the first to fire, but if the British fire first, then fire as fast as you can. And as the fifers and drummers played the white cockade, Lieutenant Colonel John Robinson and Major John Buttrick led the regiments down the hill towards the Old North Bridge. And upon seeing this rush, the British fall back to the far side of the river, and they curiously begin to pull up the planks on the Old North Bridge. They're already retreating. Their primary objective is forsaken. And that's where the tide of the Battle of Lexington and Concord turned at the Old North Bridge. Um, as a colonial reenactor with the Lincoln Minutemen, I got to participate in the Battle of Old North Bridge. And somehow, I was a lousy militiaman. It took me well over a minute to prime and load my musket. I, but I wound up in the vanguard. I was in, there were, we marched three abreast, and I was in the right van. And all of a sudden, I see this column of British coming and uh, you can just see just uh, their glistening bayonets. And I said, cool. And then they knelt down and pointed their muskets at me. And I was afraid. And I felt just like that young man on April 19, 1775. Talk about uh, uh, traveling back in time. This is play three, uh, Amos Doolittle. This is the engagement at the North Bridge in Concord. This is an eyewitness account of what happened at Concord. And you can see the British on the right. And on the left, you can see the militia coming to the Old North Bridge. When the British began retreating, British ranking officers, Colonel Francis Smith had a leg wound and Major John Pitcairn was thrown off his horse and injured. And their command is in disarray. Their orders are unclear and they just come upon a deadly colonial fusillade. Brigadier General Hugh Earl Percy arrives finally with an elite force, a relief column, including two six-pound field cannons of reinforcements, over 1,000 men, and three regiments of foot. So now the 700 British uh, troops are joined by uh, reserves of 1,000 men. Percy then takes Monroe Tavern as a temporary headquarters, and they recover Smith's exhausted vanguard in total disarray. So Percy's coming up the road, and then Smith's men are retreating. What are you doing? So provincial marksmen took up positions in the tree line and behind any natural cover, stone walls, and they pour sniper fire indiscriminately onto the massing British forces. And Percy orders the gunners to destroy any homes or buildings suspected of housing these snipers. The town's meeting house and several area homes are pounded by cannon, the Bonds House and Barn, the Loring's House, Deacon's House, Clockmaker Mulliken's House, and worship containing all of his tools are set alight. So six buildings are burned in total by the British. And of course, the fires are spreading due to the wind. So now you can see Lexington burning out here. Houses to the right set fire by the British. Panic. You can see there are wounded people in the foreground, the British column coming up the road in Lexington. During this covering action, the soldiers of foot deliberately set barns and hay piles ablaze, and they used the smoke haze to maneuver in and reposition to key offensive points to boister their salient defenses. They were using a smoke screen. And the British also had their ammo wagons lagging behind, and Gage's newly issued ammo wagons were being captured in West Cambridge. So now they're running out of am ammunition. The situation is critical. That's a color image of what's going on in Lexington. Again, the fire is raging on the right. So word gets back to England now. And this is uh, John Carter Brown, the retreat from Lexington to Concord. Quote, wild Irish asses defeated by the brave American militia. So to join the army back those days of, in Britain, it's, it was usually lower class uh, people that joined the army. Poor people, a lot of Irishmen joined the British Army. So, um, of course, they were, and you can see the fires raging in this image here. But uh, as they retreated, they were scoffed at uh, by people in Great Britain. This is Plate 4 by Amos Doolittle. And this is a view of the south part of Lexington. Again, you can see the fires raging set by the British. You can see the columns. And in the foreground, you can see colonists behind stone walls with their muskets. Paul Revere would pass away on May 10th, 1818, and become one of America's most revered heroes for the fight for American independence. Hear, hear, Mr. Revere. Some great books. Uh, first of all, in order to understand what happened on Paul Revere's midnight ride, you need to learn about the powder alarm that took place on September 1st, 1774. That operation by the British was brilliant. Okay, They did it under the cover of night. They literally took the loyalist, uh, the loyalist powder along with the malicious powder, 
out of Somerville and marched it all the way out to Castle Island. And, uh, and the colonists were dumbfounded and they resolved to never be caught by surprise again. So now it was the British who were dumbfounded when they marched out to Lexington and Concord where virtually everyone knew of their imminent attack. Another great book by Mr. David Hackett Fisher is Paul Revere's Ride. So that concludes my lecture. Paul Revere is coming. I'm John Horgan. Thanks for joining me on Journey Through the Past. This program has been brought to you by the Wellesley Council on Aging.